Hello all, this is Dr. Misha Kwasniewski from Penn State, and today is going to be my, the first of two talks where we will go over some of cider making fundamentals, and then in next week's talk we'll discuss more about some of the specific ways in which you can improve and manipulate uh, flavor and some of the, the nitty-gritty details of being successful. In producing this product. So in any fermented product, basically you're trying to preserve in a controlled manner rather than just allowing that fruit or milk or any number of things to rot. And in this case, the big thing that we're trying to control is one, what sort of microbes are doing the fermentation and aligned with that is also keeping it away from oxygen. So basically just by controlling those two things rather than have something that's nasty or you know smell like vinegar you're able to take that apple and produce a beverage that's good for months or even years. The overall process, we've talked about growing apples in some of the previous talks, and then there's this gray area that's partially what the cider maker is considering and partially the realities of what's happening out in the field, which is harvest. Then those fruit are ground up or milled, pressed, fermented, and then aged and aging can mean any number of things sometimes it's actually just a matter of letting um, your fermented cider rest and some of the particulate to fall out or it could be actually aging in barrels and trying to get some of that uh, barrel character into the product then finally bottling and selling your finished cider I would re be remiss if I didn't start this out with you need to decide whether your intentions are to be a home cider maker, in which case you're allowed as an adult, at least federally, to make 100 gallons per year of fermented beverages. And this has to be a cross category. So if you're also a home winemaker, a home brewer, you're capped at that 100 gallons. Um, and if you have two adults within a house, two or more, you're also capped at 200 gallons. Uh, state by state, this can vary quite a bit with some more stringent and some less stringent. But at a federal level, at least, this is your allowance. If you are considering selling hard cider, then you need licensing before you start to ferment anything. Once you have the cider, if you then go ahead and start trying to file the process, you're very likely to start, um, well, one, fail at getting approval, and I've known some people to get waged some pretty hefty fines. So if you want to sell your product, the first step before you even get into any of the production is to get your licensing in order and at minimum that's going to require both state and federal licensing though there may be other local permits that you need to work through for apple harvest we discussed some of the considerations in the previous presentations but you're always going to be dealing with some conflicting goals. First and foremost, you want to make sure that you have nice ripe fruit, because if you don't have high quality ripe fruit, you're not going to be able to produce high quality uh, cider. However, nature tends to get in the way sometimes, and so you may have to harvest a bit earlier than you may have wanted to either because of weather events or disease or insects or sometimes even just the reality of timing that if you only have so many tanks and you're trying to do multiple fermentations in your fermentation tanks and then move them into storage 
you just need to be thinking through that process. Likewise, if you have really big tanks that you need to fill, you might need to blend a bunch of things that ideally you wouldn't have harvested at the same time. We've talked a little bit about whether or not to use drops. Uh, the, I would say, by and large, just avoid them. There is some caveats that may allow you to use fruit that's been on the ground, but you're in a position with especially some of the recent food safety legislation that if you get a new inspector in your locality, they might interpret it differently, and then you'll ultimately be left with fruit that or cider that's unsaleable. The main concern here is that you're getting um, microbial contamination from birds and animals and things that are potentially even fatal for humans. This is unlikely to persist into a fermented beverage, um, but certainly there has been cases with fresh cider, and as is often the case with legislation, uh, sometimes things sort of leak over into areas that m may not have really been affected, but you just have to abide by the rules to avoid being on the wrong side of it. One of the nice things about apples versus things like grapes or elderberries or any number of things that you would be making into a fermented beverage is that you can actually store them before the final processing. And in some cases, this is actually a really critical part of the production where you're allowing the fruit to ripen a bit more, even off from the tree, so you're getting some starch conversion. The fruit actually the pectin starts to break down, so you have a softer fruit that's going to release the juice more easily. However, you also need to consider that at this time, rot can spread very, very quickly, and this could be a huge problem if you aren't keeping an eye on that fruit really on a daily basis. Another consideration is whether to wash or not. Um, there's some reasons too, certainly washing, even dumping through like a vat of water or having a conveyor belt going through a water wash allows you to remove things that aren't apples or wood material or all sorts of things that you don't want to go into your grinder and into your press. On the other hand, it's another step in the process that may or may not actually be worth your time. Now, we'll be talking a lot more about sanitation in the next presentation, but it really needs to be at the forefront of every step in your cider production that you need to think about every time that I'm talking about a step from here on out that before and after you're likely to be sanitizing and cleaning and washing your equipment. And you'll notice any time you go to any commercial fermented beverage producer, there's just about always somebody with their hand on a hose or a wash bucket or something. And this is because microbes are persistent, that once they start to grow, they can create biofilms that then make it very, very hard to get them off from the equipment and potentially costly things like having to completely throw away hoses and whatnot if you don't stay on top of it. After harvesting, potentially storing, and washing your fruit, the next step becomes grinding or milling. Historically, this was actually done by using something like a stone that would pulverize the fruit. Now it's more common that you use metal blades attached to a motor that slice it up into smaller pieces, but we're not trying to get it to smoothie consistency. It's just something that is increasing the surface area and allowing the juice when it starts to be pressed to get out of the, the um, fruit. You're also at this step not really grinding up the seeds so much. You're just lightly chopping to the consistency that you see behind in this slide. Now, there's equipment that scales from 
um, hand units that you can use as a high home winemaker up to things that can do many tons an hour and I'll be discussing some of them in the next slide. If you look up in your upper left corner that gives you an indication of the old way of doing this that either by hand or by mule or pony a stone was ground in a circle going over and over the apples that then would be taken out of your mill and put into your press. Nowadays, if you look to the upper right, that's a common home-sized, home cider maker-sized mill that is doing more of a chopping motion than an actual um, grinding pulverizing motion and that holds through to the other elements like the one to the bottom left that is there's versions that scale to being able to do maybe a few hundred pounds in an hour up to a ton or more an hour one thing that you have to be wary with these smaller units is not all apples will actually fit in and so if you have nice big beautiful apples that they can start to clog up your machinery because they just weren't designed for that now in the center is a visualization of what the commercial grinding units look like and as you scale up these are designed like any other uh, commercial food process that you can use forklifts to dump in to a hopper that has a conveyor belt that then is milling and directly going into either a press or a tank or a pump so you can then move that along with minimal hand labor to your to the next step which is pressing now there are a number of different styles of presses that are used one of the classic cider presses that you'll see still very much in use today is like what's pictured to the right um, sometimes referred to as a cheese press not because it's pressing cheese or has some alternate use but because the different layers um, also are referred to as cheeses and from my understanding a cheese can be essentially anything that is pressed and within those layers you have a couple of inches of ground apples that are then placed between you know potentially a layer with a burlap sack above and below or some perforated nylon or any number of things including that initially they tended to use straw that was placed and bent over but the overall goal here is to have lots of individual layers so as that press pushes down there's good channels for the cider to flow right out and these can be really quite efficient i would say one of the downfalls really comes from the amount of effort that it takes to build up the press where there's some that are a little bit easier, but maybe not as efficient in their ability to get juice out. In the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about some of the other options like bladder presses or basket presses that are used by home winemakers, but all of them have the same basic goal is to add pressure to push the juice out of the ground apple pumice so you can then collect that juice for either drinking fresh in the case of fresh cider or for fermentation to then turn into hard cider if you're trying to make that product so as i mentioned you know like we have up in the upper right the very common um, tool for the home cider wake maker and these go up to being able to press um, you know 50 gallons or more and so 
really can be used for a small commercial operation. You're just going to have to go through many press cycles to be able to get the amount of juice that you want out. Um, in the middle, we have a similar apparatus, but it's actually being um, hydraulically driven. And so there will just be a piston that pushes that, that top basket or that top plate down, pressing it against the walls of the basket. You'll notice in both of these, there's really only pressure coming from one point. And so, and it's trying to apply that pressure to really a really large area of apple, unlike the more traditional press where you have those smaller layers and channels. So it, to really get a nice press with these, you may have to break up um, the pumice or the, the ground apples a few times to try and get all of the potential juice out. Another modern alternative is the pneumatic bladder press. And this one that I've got up to the upper left, this style goes anywhere from probably 50 to 100 gallons to being able to buy versions that can press a couple tons of apples at one given time. Some of the benefits with these is it's really, you know, you're not having to go through the layering process. So you can just essentially grind right into the press. They are automated with being able to inflate and deflate and roll around and press every little bit of um, cider out of those apples without you having to monitor it. And then lastly, the cleanup is fairly easy because they will dump right out of the bottom um, into some sort of tote that you can just take away with a forklift. Um, so there's definitely some benefits as you get to the scale that bladder presses can make your life much easier. One of the absolute critical considerations here is what sort of yield should you expect? So on average, a ton of apples is going to give you about 130 gallons. Um, that's expecting fairly efficient equipment and you being able to do a really you know nice grind and long press cycle. You could be getting as little as you know 100 gallons per ton of apples, or you may be able to get a little bit more out of that if especially you have the time to say add peptic enzymes, which will further break down the apple matter after grinding. This is a whole nother step that, you know, adds time to it. And there's, you know, differences of opinion on some believing this can help flavor versus there's some potential concerns that it also can have some, some deleterious effects. As you've heard and may be aware, there's, you know, a broad categorization of cider apples basically based around whether they have high amounts of acid or high tannin. And so bitter sharps would have both high acid and high tannin and, you know, so on with bitter sweets, sharps and sweet. It should be of note that these categories don't really get into how much sugar they have. It's just really more of a ratio of sugar to acid. And that's the same thing with dessert apples, that they may actually have a lot of acid, but they'll have a lot of sugar to balance out that acid. So to really have an idea of how much sugar, how much acid, or how much tannin you have, you need to do some measurements. It's not enough to just sort of say, well, I've got something that's a bitter sharp, therefore it must have everything that I need to make a high quality cider. So as I mentioned, you know, the apple is providing the sugar for the alcohol, and this is fairly easy to measure with either a refractometer or hydrometer. Not, either of these are available for most homebrew or um, home winemaking shops um, and are really easy to use. I'll be going through them in uh, the next slide. Um, 
Measuring acid is also fairly easy. Um, you can measure both of the two parameters. And I mentioned both of these because they have different values to you as a cider maker, either pH that can be measured using a simple pH meter or test strips, or titratable acidity, which is actually more of the measure of how much acid rather than what pH the cider is at, you need to do through titration with a strong base. This isn't terribly complicated, and there are some great YouTube videos of this, actually some of which um, were even done by a couple of my graduate students. But if you're interested in measuring titratable acidity, I would say just search for titratable acidity cider or titratable acidity wine, and you'll find somebody that'll do a really nice rundown for you. Alternatively, there's a number of for-profit testing sites for both beer and wine that would be happy to measure things for cider. Tannin, on the other hand, tends to be fairly difficult. Um, so I would basically figure that the only way that you can really figure out your tannin profile is through experience of tasting your apples and tasting the finished cider. So as I mentioned, you can use either a hydrometer on the top, which floats depending on how much sugar there is, or a refractometer on the bottom that measures how much light bends depending on how much is in solution. Um, the one on the top, you merely just sort of look at how high that hydrometer floats, whereas the one at the bottom, you've got a little scale that you look at that will tell you what your Brix reading is. And so Brix is one gram of sucrose in 100 grams of water. Um, that equates to about 0.083 pounds per gallon of sugar. A typical apple will have somewhere between 10 and 20 degrees bricks. So we have 10 to 20 grams per 100 grams of water. Um, if you don't have the sugar amount that you need, you can do something called chapitalization and this is the practice where you just add sugar into your product. And so since we know one gram yields one degree bricks, if we know we have 100 grams of water or 1,000 grams or 10 million grams of water, it's fairly simple to figure out how much sugar we would need to add to get a given output. If you don't want to do this, you can also find an easy calculator pretty easily online. One point of note is both of these measurements do not work towards the end of fermentation, and it becomes much harder once you start having alcohol present to measure how much sugar is left. The acidity of apples comes primarily from malic acid. Um, the typical amount that you would expect and is desired in cider apples is between about 0.5 and 0.8 percent. Now, depending on where you're reading, you may see this same exact value put in a few different ways. And so 0.5 to 0.8 grams per 100 milliliters would be the exact same values as would 5 to 8 grams per liter because with a liter, we're just dealing with a thousand milliliters. But I wanted to mention this because depending on where you say get information or what books you're reading, you may see all sorts of different values and you really need to pay attention to the units. Otherwise you can get a little bit confused. Another critical thing in understanding this acid, acidity and pH is that these two values aren't interchangeable. The acidity is the actual measurement of how much, either how much total acid there is, or more than likely you're going to be measuring how much titratable acid. So how much malic is able to neutralize a given amount of a 
of sodium hydroxide at a given concentration. And so without getting into this in too much detail, basically by dropping in a normalized solution of sodium hydroxide, you're able to figure out how much acidity you have in a solution. Acidity is a really good predictor of flavor. So if you wanna know how sour your cider is going to be and how much bite, this will give you a good idea. But pH is also a critical measurement because it is one of the factors that really um, defines how stable your product's going to be. And if at all possible, if you can get the pH below four, you're likely to have a much more stable product. Now I mentioned you can potentially add sugar to increase you know, the degrees spricks. You could also likewise add malic acid um, if you needed to balance that out. But to make a more pure and traditional product, um, it is common that you're probably going to be blending different apples that have different elements um, to bring to this so that you get ultimately a well-rounded product. One of the ways you can do this is just harvest at the same time off from a bunch of different apple trees, but this expects that all of your apples are ripe and at the same degree of ripeness at the same time. Alternatively, you can harvest, press, ferment when the apples is, are ripe, and then do more of a control blending when you have your near finished product so you can create the product that you want um, to have. In many ways, this is where the magic starts to happen, that we have juice that is only going to last so long. It's going to go from, if you just leave it around, to start to bubble and ferment till it eventually becomes vinegar. Now, if we control it, we're able to produce the product that we're aiming for. And one of the great things about apples is that they're covered in yeast. Um, historically, this has been known even be long before we knew what yeast were, that if you put apples or grapes or other fruits into things like unfermented beer wort, that they'd start to bubble and create the product that we wanted. And this has been used back for thousands and thousands of years. It was even common practice in the Middle Ages to put your bread dough under an apple tree to be able to get it to rise quickly and then you'd have a nice starter culture. Nowadays, it's far more common to use selected yeast strains that may have actually been originally collected from apples, but will give you a more predictable outcome. These yeasts generally come in um, either freeze-dried packets or can sometimes be in fresh pump punch packs or things, and they'll create different aromas and mouthfeel, and some of them are more or less suited to higher or lower alcohol. Some of them have the ability to stave off infection by other unwanted microbes. Um, if you go to most yeast manufacturers, they'll have you know tens if not hundreds of different yeasts with all sorts of descriptors. In a way, this is a little bit like looking at a seed catalog, that there's a lot of promises that are being made by the yeast manufacturers that you may or may not actually experience when you get them home, but it does give you a good idea. And beyond going by what the manufacturer says, I would say going by what other cider makers like to use is a great way for figuring out what yeast you would like to use to make a specific product. We'll discuss this a lot more in the next presentation next week. So during fermentation, you have a lot of bubbling and sort of this foam that is being created on the top. And 
for your tanks, you need to have quarter or perhaps even a little bit more of extra space during fermentation to make sure that there's enough space for the fermentation to occur and for the whole volume of the cider that's fermenting to exist. Now, if you left that headspace, you're going to be putting it at um, really a bad situation of potentially having all sorts of oxygen getting into your product. And so you then need to move it from that into a smaller tank um, to ensure that it's stable. There's many different types of materials to use for tanks. Stainless is definitely one of the most common now because it's rarely easy to clean and incredibly sturdy. Um, but there are plastic options. People even classically used to use concrete and other things to hold onto it. One of the things to consider is once you get over about 50 or 100 gallons of cider is that one of the byproducts of fermentation is not just alcohol and CO2, but also heat. And so to make sure that your product or your fermentation doesn't overheat, you may actually need to actively cool it. And so these tanks are dippled with a glycol jacket around so even as the yeast put off lots and lots of heat, you're able to cool it down and keep that fermentation happy. As I've been mentioning throughout, oxygen management is one of the critical elements of having a successful fermentation. That if you allow after, especially after that first active fermentation, oxygen to start to get in. Um, you can have really quick and irreversible changes to quality. During fermentation, um, generally, you're fairly well protected, but it's commonplace, especially on smaller fermentations, to have something that looks more or less like what's in the top right, which is called an airlock, which will allow CO2 gas to come out, but air not to get back in. This is also really helpful for later on that if you have expansion and contraction that you're not causing your tank or carboy to explode. So it can let a little bit of size change happen and everything's nice and safe. On the bottom, <clears throat> what we have is a variable capacity tank. And these can be a really huge um, economic saver because otherwise you need to have the ability to basically perfectly fit any volume of cider in without any headspace. And what a variable capacity tank allows you to do is raise and lower that lid so there's always no headspace. After um, the primary fermentation, you need to go through a step called racking. And sometimes this is done a couple different times. And one of the goals is just purely to get the cider clarified without having to go through a filter or anything. Um, but it's also a way of helping to stabilize and ensure that the aromas that you want are going to be within that. And so by racking, we're merely pumping or siphoning um, our clear product, so off from the top, into another vessel, leaving any of the yeast or seeds or skin bits or anything that was not in our, you know, what we want to be in our finished product over there. Also by doing this, you ensure that one of the points that you can get this sort of rotten egg or cabbage-like aroma doesn't happen. And if you leave a cider too long on the lees, or the, that's another word for the yeast that fell out of solution, you can have problems with reduced aromas. Now, in the next talk, we're going to get a little bit more into prepping things for bottling and sanita sanitizing. Um, for bottling and filtration and um, how we would make a sweet cider, how we would make a carbonated cider. Um, but 
very simply here, I just wanted to bring the process to a close by saying one way or another, after we've gone through fermentation, we now need to get that into a bottle. And it can be done very simply by a unit like we've got at the bottom that's able to fill three bottles at a time. And I personally have done pallets by this method. Or you can have scale up to units that have six that are somewhat automated or even have your own bottling line. One of the nice developments is that there's a lot of mobile bottling lines in a lot of different locations now. So as you scale up to a size where having your own bottling done doesn't really make sense, as does not doing it all by hand, you can actually have somebody come through and do of your, all of your bottling for you. So my closing thoughts for today are, if you are planning to do this commercially, um, start working on your licensing right away. And I would very much advise that you at least consult with somebody who has experience with this um, because it can be a really large bottleneck and potentially a huge cost if you're waiting and waiting and waiting to get the go-ahead to move ahead with your production facility and producing something. Now, whether you're a home cider maker or commercially, the two most critical things that I have seen impact quality. And if every place was able to just hit these two points, they would consistently have a good product is first sanitation and cleanliness that the better you can do this, the better product you're consistently going to have. And then secondly, minimize oxygen exposure. That after fermentation, you now have a product that is sort of fragile, that it's only stable because it doesn't have access to oxygen. And if you leave it in a tank that's not topped up, if you pump it around with lots of oxygen getting into it, each one of those um, actions is going to make it less and less and less stable and give you a chance that you're no longer going to have a product that anyone wants to buy. All right, with that, thank you. And um, we'll have time for questions. Last week, we actually have a bonus for you that wasn't in the original program that we have Josh from Wave Cider in Columbia, who is going to tell you a little bit about the actual process of a cidery in Missouri and give you a look at some of their production. And then after that, we'll have um, time for any of your questions. Thanks, Misha. Wave Cider Company, uh, we got started up in 2020 um, to make cider. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Josh Ryan. And um, that's a shot of the front of our building. That's our tasting room and everything here in Columbia. Um, we got founded, we were founded in 2020. Um, I am the cider maker, co-founder of it. Um, it's an offshoot of our brewery, Logboat Brewing Company here in Columbia. Uh, we got started making cider. We always wanted to make cider, um, but decided when we wanted to get into it to start a whole new brand. And we didn't have any space in the brewery to produce cider. So we decided to make an effort to just find a new facility and, and make it happen. So that's what we got going on. A um, couple years into running it, it's been a lot of fun for us. Um, I have a, a short slideshow here with some photographs of the process, which really closely follows uh, Misha's presentation about how things happen. Um, um, so I wanted to run through that and just talk a little bit about what we have, and then I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. So um, here we go. Here's some photographs of some of this past year's harvest. Um, a lot of these apples came from Boone County. Um, if you look closely, you see so not all the apples are in great shape, but they came off of the they came off the trees into us and went into cold storage in our cooler uh, for oh it was about a month or so. Um, we called a lot of these bad apples off and everything like that, but um, a lot of what was here there's some pears. On the left side of the screen, you can see that 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 um, we pressed as well. Um, but these were all un, unsprayed, untreated apples. These were organically grown, naturally grown apples. So they 
tend to have a lot more of that that um, sooty splotch on them um, in that regard. So uh, we have the apples here, you know. Um, this little guy is our apple grinder. Um, we haven't got into a really large operation of, of, of crushing and pressing apples. Um, both seasons now, 2020 and 2021, we've pressed about two to 3,000 pounds of apples, um, which is a lot of labor for this little guy, but this little thing does the job really well. It has a little motor on it that runs and, and we drop apples in the chute and they crush up real nice and we drop it into buckets that go underneath um, underneath here, uh, the grinder. Um, it's a piece of plastic, this HDPE plastic, and there's some garb, carbide teeth on it that allow us the ability to um, crush everything up. After we crush everything up into buckets, we pour it into this bladder press. Uh, this little guy is a 40 liter press. Um, we can fill it up with about three buckets worth of, worth of pulp and press about 10 gallons of juice out of every pressing. Uh, this bladder is filled with water. Uh, it runs up to about three bar pressure or about 45 PSI. Um, and does a pretty good job of it. It's not the most efficient, but it's fast enough for us. And for these amounts of apples that we're pressing in the day, um, it's been working for us. It's doing pretty well. Um, it won't always be the case. We have an orchard planted, about four acres of trees planted that in about five years, hopefully we'll get us a lot more volume of our own apples to, to press. Um, so we were able to buy this squeeze box. Uh, this squeeze box is, a, is made by a company called Good Nature. Um, they don't make these old models anymore, but this is something that's kind of sought after by uh, fruit pressers, apple cideries, you know, specifically, because uh, it's a pretty simple machine, but it works by a uh, hydraulic press to move back and forth. So as one side is pressed and the other side is able to empty out the pulp in it. Um, you fill in your apple pulp in the top. There's a bag, there's bags that go into this and there's little plastic sleeves that are there to keep it all pressed. So it's, you take the cheese press that we saw in the video and you move it on its side and it works that way. And there's a catch pan on the bottom and uh, all that fun stuff. So we're looking forward to getting this put to use this coming fall. Uh, it's a brand new addition for us. Um, after we're pressing all of our juice, um, hell, here's a shot of us in action here this past fall uh, pressing apples. Um, there's Gino, the farmer back there. A lot of his apples were pressed this past year. And there's Nick and Bear hanging out our bladder press in action. There's a bucket full of some real foamy, good times, uh, fresh pressed juice there. Um, this hose coming out of it is hooked up to a pump that is sucking the juice out and sending it to a fermenter. We have a, a uh, diaphragm pump. Um, doing all that work. Um, Barrick and Nick are busy washing apples back there. So they're scrubbing off apples and picking out anything that's rotten. And then whatever's ready to go is getting dropped into the mill and being crushed up. After we press, it goes to our fermentation tanks. Um, these are some of our nicer ones here. Um, on the left, these are two uh, brand new 2000 liter uh, variable capacity tanks. Um, that just came online uh, late this past year. Um, and then on the right is the bottom side of, of a, of a 7,500 liter tank. So um, 2,000 gallons or so And those. We do most of our fermentations in these. Um, a lot of our canned products that we're making, we're buying juice from, from plants that are pressing apples already for us. We have some good friends in Marthasville, Missouri at Happy Apples Farms. Um, that have a belt press, which is highly efficient. And we can buy it from them at a good price and not have to do all the work ourselves. And the quality is still pretty high in my opinion. So um, these nice stainless steel tanks uh, do a pretty good job for us here and we're happy with them. Um, a lot of the fun comes into uh, oak gauging our cider as well. Uh, this guy here is an oak fooder um, made by our friends in St. Louis at Fooder Crafters of America. Um, we at the cidery here at Waves um, have started a program where we put together blends 
where a portion of the blend, if not all of the blend comes from this fooder itself. Um, we've done two releases so far. Uh, we're working on number three and, and beyond, but it's one of those things where we will take some cider that's been fermented and aged in oak for a little while to give it time to condition and take on some, um, some different flavors, some oak flavors. As the oak neutralizes, it just turns into more of, of a softening of the flavors, I feel like in that regard. Um, but we really like that thing quite a bit. Um, here's some shots of, of the bench here uh, doing some work. Um, one of the things I wanna stress, and we talked about it, it was talked about in the video. Um, this little device here, if you can see my cursor on the left side of the screen, the Venmetrica SC300 is a pretty affordable tabletop pH meter and titration um, device that allows you to measure titratable acidity, be able to measure uh, free and total SO2 in your cider and pH as well. Um, you guys will get more into SO2 next week, I believe with, with the discussion, but this little device here is super affordable, just a few hundred dollars and is a lifesaver when it comes to doing your own testing um, at home or in, in your cidery, uh, pretty awesome stuff. On the right side here, I'm rehydrating yeast for a small batch here. Uh, we got some champagne yeast there. Behind that is uh, some white wine yeast hiding out and um, measuring water temperature to rehydrate properly. So I'll get more stuff that you guys get to learn about next week. After fermentation, we are, we are racking um, to get the cider off the lees. Uh, we're using a, a, a cheat filter here to make sure that we can clean everything up uh, well enough. We don't have the luxury of a lot of time um, in the commercial setting. So the sheet filter allows us the ability to be able to pull, um, well, to set, mechanically separate through, the, the, through these sheets, um, yeast and pectin and things like that to, to be create a clear product and a, a stable product. So. Typically, what we'll do is rack off the, the lees after fermentation um, without the filter, and then I'll rack it again uh, without the filter, and then I'll be able to run it through the filter sheet. Um, I don't like the idea of having to run my cider through multiple sheet filters, um, so I try, to, I try to give it as much time to settle as possible, and I'll move it uh, from tank to tank in order to facilitate that. Um, that is utilized with this pump here. This is a this is a lobe pump. They call it. It's a positive displacement pump, um, which means it always builds pressure. And um, when you move a liquid through it, it creates suction actually, and allows you to be able to put pressure on the filter sheets to make things happen. Um, all of our tanks have these racking arms on them, uh, so we can dictate where we want to pull the cider from in the tank. Um, that allows us to be able to pull cider from the tank without sucking all of the yeast out of the bottom of the tank. Um, on the far right, here's a picture of the tank as it's just about empty. Um, you can see in the back ridge over there, there's what, what winemakers have told me is they call the beach uh, where the yeast starts to show up. There's a little bit hiding down here as well. Um, so as that drains out, we can, we can know then uh, when to stop trying to pull cider out of the tank. Um, after filtration, it gets packaged. Um, in the packaging setup, we have a little forehead canning line that we package most of our cider in. Um, it's an inline filler, um, brings the cider through, packs it into cans, and on it goes. Um, all the fun stuff it is. It's a really, really uh, convenient tool for us and you know, uh, allows us to package up 2,000 gallons of cider in about, well, in a full day. It's a full day worth of work to make it happen. Um, the end result is packaged stuff. Um, on the left, you see our canned products. We do do some bottling. Um, sorry, I don't have any pictures of our bottling machine. Um, it is a pretty simple setup in that regard, but um, yeah, we're able to put that together as well. So we have some bottled stuff. Um, and that's a real short rundown of what we got going on at Waves. So I just want to say thanks for letting me um, show you what I got going on here.